Okay. All righty, here we go. Yes. It's Peter Cola again. Um, you might have seen me on uh, Nino's uh, Corner. I did a show with Nino and also on YouTube or once on YouTube or both. I have on occasion done some things called the spiritual therapies with Peter and Anna Cola. Today I have Anna Cola with me. She also yes. does some work with Nino. She has, um, she works with his Nino's insiders. So if you happen to be one of those Nino insiders that has a, taken advantage or has tried to, get, to join that little group of uh, taking back our finance or our uh, purchasing power from the deep state, uh, they do it through this, this one way. To, they started doing this through the Nino's insiders. You will probably get to talk to my wife. And that is her right there. Um, and I, real quick, Anna is uh, my wife, beautiful wife. We've been married now almost six years, five, a little over five years. And um, she's from Europe. She's from Amsterdam, but originated from Poland. A dancer, international dancer, dancer, danced professionally for many, many years in the circus and in and uh, on TV and on uh, before thousands of people, crowds of all kinds of different people and a circus performer, uh, magician's assistant and all kinds of things later became a instructor, a choreographer and uh, finally a uh, um, Pilates instructor and in where she started doing women's empowerment. And that's where, uh, that's how I met her. And uh, she kind of does the mind body spiritual applications to Pilates like I do the mind, body, spiritual application to physical therapy. And actually, I probably learned the majority of the spiritual stuff from her. So I don't know if you want to add anything, darling, before I go on to the second half of this introduction. Oh, I just want to add that. Yeah, thank you very much. You think mm -hmm. very highly of me. Of course. And I started uh, like on very physical level, dancing and uh, even teaching Pilates and it quickly become just an excuse to bring forth the conversations with other women and uh, bringing the important subjects. So when we exercise, we also talk, we also learn uh, how, to, how to respect and love yourself enough not to cope with bad stuff in the world. And this is like the hot topic now, we all need it. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And Anna happens to also be the information guru in our family. She gathers her information, <laughs> not only from all the people, including my connection with Nino. I actually have the thanks through her, um, but oh, many, many others. And uh, she has gathered this information, not only from people via the United States, like we do here, but also from her boots on the ground in her back home countries, that she's lived, she's got friends in all those different European countries and she calls them and gets info, first-hand info that may not uh, make it through this censorship. Awaken or, friends. Yeah, the filtered, the filtered, uh, you know, mainstream medias of BBC, you know, MSN and uh, all of the different uh, C C C CNN, they control a lot of that stuff and we are held a little bit at their mercy. Today, oh, before we get started, I do have a couple of books. We are not monetized. So if you want to in any way support this, our little endeavor, we do work on people. A lot of people we treat for free and um, we have to do it funded somehow. You know, the insurance company won't pay for it. So I have a book. It's called Heal Yourself for God's Sake. I tabulated a, about 35 years of practice of applying God in the last 15 to the treatment uh, scenario and what the effect was uh, of that, seeing many miracles, but also seeing uh, facilitated treatments, uh, therapies, and uh, evaluations of uh, seeing things that you just normally wouldn't see. I wrote a lot of it down in the books, in the book. I've written many other books I haven't yet to publish. I have also Quantum Ascension, and uh, this is a book where I ask God, well, how exactly does it work on a quantum level? And he told me. And so that's kind of how I do everything. I ask God when I don't know, if I see a patient and I don't understand what to do with them, I just ask God, and he tells me. And so that's the basis of what we do. That's how I met Nino, helped him a little bit with some of the things he had, and he helped me. And uh, now uh, we're friends. And so, so it began and so it has gone since. Today, we're doing a sort of sports commentation, which I have done a few times for Nino, a sports commentation on his 
uh, some of his guests, and this happens to be Ivory Hecker is here today, and she was she was here, and and I was very impressed with her, and um, so I did a hot topic or a hot news. Ivory has the balls to take on the MSM today with Nino, and so that's what I'm going to report on. It's going to come out like a report, and then Anna will jump in here and there as we talk. Another hot off the press report from the spiritual therapy guy, Peter Kohler, reporting with his muse, Anna Kohler, my is my muse. <laughs> Nino's insider intelligence gathering extraordinaire, bringing our somewhat sporadic side sports commentary news blog video. The ever exciting and often boxing ring-esque turpitudes of our friend, Nino, David Nino Rodriguez brings to our slumbering eyes like some just north of the border, you know, heavyweight fighter like he is, his gladiator style reality news show with all the violent vigor one could hope for under, of course, the watchful eye of our all-knowing mass marketing, social media executive ownership, our own big brother knows best censorship restraints. <sighs> yes, tries yet again. And with first round knockout delivery style, I may add dispensing to this world of ours, tidbits, first round, few rounds of ammo, occasional right hook, and yet again, a bag zoom to the moon, Alice, and is dished out into this ever so endearing crowd. You know, this crowd that gives him shit more than often that have all the patience and self digging capabilities of the average frog slowly being brought to the boil in the little peachy dish, slowly being warmed up. Or at least it would appear. So when the big guy himself happens to bring in a guest who might not pan out in the, in the entertaining or actual fight quality level they have, meaning the fans have so become accustomed to or expecting, well, they bitch and moan as he reported today a little bit. Cry me a river, I'd like to say. You know, it's not, you know, it's not like, you know, he can make them uh, all be superstars when he comes on. You know, the, he doesn't know. These people call up and, and, and want to come on. They have tidbits. They bring them. They, they, want, they want to reveal on the show. How does he know if they're, if they're, you know, something positive or something negative? He just doesn't know until till they actually show up. It is not that all different in the in the prize fighting uh, situation. I mean, it's not like he can guarantee the quality, authenticity, or even the level of actual fighter spirit prior to giving them a shot in his thirty eight, you know, fights, or many, many, many more. I guess you never know for sure if a fighter, especially one who has a little prior experience in the ring, are they going to turn out to be a a phenom, you know, a Rocky, yeah, a writer. Give a good show, put out a more than a few solid, you know, some some rounds of content, some good rounds. Go the distance, even bring the few combos themselves into the fray with the Hispanic make you panic. Being a true contender is is that is ever saturated somewhat this market of watch the watered down shit show that we're living in today. We have all we have out there handed to us through the news views mainstream media and all these other truthers that keep bringing all kinds of predictions and all kinds of different things. You know, this one's arrested, that one's arrested, this one died, that one's not. And, and we're supposed to somehow siphon through it and figure out which ones are telling the truth and which ones aren't. Jack, some jackass CEO who knows what's best to, to tell us what the real news is, you know, Facebook, you know, Twitter. Or they just belly up, limp dick, wet noodle or with their skinny little arms and ridiculous pros run around like little school boy, girl, eager to show off their not so attractive polka dot undies until they find a way out of the ring faster than they went in. At least are those that have an eye, at least for those that have an eye to see this stuff, you know, and charade through the construct that occasionally there's a, there is a fraud among the group or maybe sometimes a few in a row. Plants by the bad guys who want nothing better to discredit the whole friggin' show, Nito included, like a turd under the bed. You know, what, what are your thoughts, honey? I mean, it, it is kind of ridiculous that they that he has to come on and kind of... You know, Nino never claims that he knows at all. He asks questions and uh, he leaves it to our discernment to 
to see, to use our common sense to listen and to, you know, to, to figure it out. And uh, David and also Charlie Ward, they're inviting a lot of different guests. We're hearing a lot of different point of view and uh, it's up to us what we make of it. And, uh, you know, sometimes even the, the bad guys that are there and uh, spreading false information, they provoke discussion. They provoke people search, asking questions, and we all need to do it now. We need yeah. to question everything. It's so true. You know, from the physical therapy that I prescribe, teach, evaluate, et cetera, I have learned that to do it from a evaluate and apply therapies from a mind or physical, which is very small and momentary in space, to a mind which can have many interpretations for the same thing, but they're all based on physical experiences to a spiritual belief. And that is a belief ultimately, do you believe in God or don't you? Do you, believe, do you want God in your life or don't you? Do you? Are you attracted to good or are you attracted to evil? And it's, it is no different with all of these people, it's perspective. Some people are basically, they are just stuck in the physical. And so that's all they see is with physical eyes. You know, if they can't feel it, touch it, see it, it doesn't exist. Some people are more experiential. You can convince them differently through experiences or proofs or not the non-existence of proofs. And, and they waver between this and that, depending on how they're convinced. Is the earth flat? Is it not? Are dinosaurs real or not? If I throw my, uh, myself up in the air, will I fall to the earth or not? You know, will I just float? I mean, it's all experiential. And then there's the belief. Do we, do we uh, life after death, do demons exist? If they do, what are they doing? Are demons and aliens the same thing? Is Jesus coming back? Did Jesus even exist? A lot of people have a lot of questions. It just depends on perspective. You can be talking the same little thing, and it could mean something completely different depending on the perspective. Not completely different, but co completely different in view. All right, back to our little show. But we won't let them, my dear boxing armchair observers, want to be patriots, pot potential light walkers, light walkers. We know the truth when we hear it. And like Nino, we can throw it all into the fish flopping ringers. They want, they can throw in all the fish flopping ringers. They will not, they will not dismay us. We know the champ is about the truth and fights many battles for us. We would love to have the guts to jump in ourselves, but seem to lack the bigger arms or hardened jaw to take the punch. Yet thankfully so, Ivory was displaying an astonishing strong chin and an enduring full round capacity stamina. While maybe not the big arms, quite slender to be assured at least from what could appear, lacking nothing in the deliverance to bring once again a solid show to the canvas of fortitude. I love that canvas of fortitude. Courage and inspiration to many others who have had to make their own similar choices, yours included, meaning me. Some small but ever increasing dramatic choices where they used to be simple choices between simple and good and bad. I mean, in, in the early days, 20, 30 years ago, you just had to decide that you want to, you know, be good to people or bad to people. It was simple as that, mean, rude, steal from them. Should I continue to cheat this client or that or deny their benefits? An employee might say when they work for a company where it's proven increasingly more frequently that they are cheating them, stealing from them, you know, maybe even hurting them. Knowing it's, that is wrong, what do you do? But the boss, even the industry as a whole, seems to be learning more and more, leaning more and more to the sentiment of what is good for the company and increasingly less concerned for the very constituents that fund it. What are we to do? I mean, you, can't, you don't have to go much further than to call your average company out there and try to get all the customer service. They hardly exist. Now you got to send them an email and then wait six months before they maybe respond. A lot of good that does. A common question one Ivory makes known is in her own early rounds of jabs and counter blocks in this fight. As everyone or anyone may have read my blogs, 
they see that I've kind of had to do the same thing or happen to hear me speak with David on my own newly created channel, Spiritual Therapies with Anna and Peter Cola, Peter and Anna Cola. I don't mean to say that this is the order. It happens to be on our channel. I can change it now that she's on the TV with me. Anna, ladies first. We'll have to come to the realization by now. I can only speak from my experience in the healthcare providing great Coliseum arena of gladiatorial performances, which usually had all the spectacle and attractive interests of perhaps a single observer or at most a few already beaten down participants. Basically what I'm saying is I had my own patients and I was dealing with patients one at a time. So I didn't have to mess around too much with a large specter of observers like um, our new friend, um, this gal, what was, what was her name again? I gotta go all the way back to the top. Ivory, yeah, a nice name, Ivory. Anyways, where did I leave off here? Oh, shoot, I shouldn't have done that. I messed, messed myself up. Yep. Okay. Well, anyways, most beaten down participants in my group. But one can be assured that choosing between right and wrong, especially in the job site, is not a manifestation that has recently been um, put to test, but it's one that's been around for quite a long time and seems to be increasing as the years go by. But our particular act, it was, you know, like I said, it was a one-on-one. -on -one. It was kind of off to the side. It was never really brought out in the mainstream, almost like a circus act that never really made it to the big ring, but just sat off in this, off of the way from the big tent and more like a pony ride attraction and some droopy little pony out on the fringe of the great show, out of sight, out of mind. System continues to throw a whip across its back, around and around it goes, carrying that crying little child, everyone, you know, away from anyone who can help or care, except of course those white face, face clowns who seem to be around, always around, waiting to take a bite. My wife was in the circus, by the way, and uh, she probably had more than one clown or pony, although I don't think she ever rode a pony. I don't know. Where no, I think I rode elephants more than ponies. <laughs> and <laughs> I didn't uh, really like clowns very much, especially white clowns. A lot of children are afraid clowns. of them. What? I don't think anybody likes clowns. I don't know. A lot of children are afraid of those white clowns and uh, a lot of those clowns, they really don't like children. I know it firsthand. Yeah. Somehow it's supposed to be the other way around, but it is like it is. Yeah. Now, and uh, How funny is that, that throughout the, you know, here you're talking about, I, I grew up, but I only went to a few circuses when I was young, Barnum and Bailey. And then I, maybe one other one, I don't know, I don't remember the others' names, but they were all over, you know, they came through Wisconsin and we went, we went when we were little. And I can remember then never being afraid of clowns, never really liking them, especially the white faced clouds. They, then they were, they were never, they were never yeah. pleasant. They were more, you know, they only carried balloons around or something like that, but, but they were always, they always seemed mean, you know, and it's funny that you have the same experience on the other side of the world, you know, so huh, interesting. Could do the further analysis on that one. For me, the choice has always been at almost as soon as the as the industry became more of a big pharma, insurance driven, regulated, and controlled, and finally seized, or at least bribed, the politicians to grant these industries the right to buy the major share of all the healthcare providing options, which took place in the late 80s and early 90s. Regardless if we're speaking of hospitals, evaluation labs, pharmacies, healthcare providers, even doctor's offices controlled these. They controlled the pricing. Who cares if they raised prices? Who cares if they made the, the costs so ridiculous that people were scared to even think about going to the hospital, thus needing to have insurance? Have to have it because heaven forbid if you have something happen and it ruin your family, couldn't have the money to pay. Control these, control the pricing. Who cares about the raising of the prices? They just pay themselves from one industry to the other. And you know, if you reduce the profits in this one, they can up the costs in the other. So as the as they pay more bills to the hospitals, they own the hospitals. So well, yeah, they make more profits there. And now they can say to their constituents, "Well, we have higher costs. We have to raise your insurance rates." And it's on and on a game they play with our minds and make us afraid, ever afraid of getting sick or, or having some long term care or poor granny having to get you know, 
whatever, a little toe operated on, and then it's going to cost $30,000, $40,000, right? Raise the prices, another easily blamed. They can blame, you know, blame somebody, have a fall guy. Who better to blame than the doctor? You know, they drive around expensive cars and they still demand that $40 copay from all the uh, patients, whether they can afford it or not. So, hey, why not blame him? It's his fault. It's never their fault. Why not? They have the long control, the education, research, every every media control, the control, every advertising, controlled by the advertising dollar, control all the work. You can't even watch TV today. And eight out of 10 ads are from pharmaceuticals, if not insurance. Control all the workers if they don't do what you tell them, simply fire them or hire others who will. Being told not to cover someone you know was right or needing. Going against the boss's big orders. Yeah, then you know the boss. Yeah, he has a choice. Does he side with you or side with those who pay him? You can thank God you were only being told to do this lately, Ivory, because I've been having to deal with this for 30 freaking years. I had it shoved down my throat since the early 90s, long before Obama in his so-called care ever lifted his ugly head out of the weeds, ready to slither in and take complete control of an industry that was supposed to be for the betterment, for the for betterment of people who finance it in the first place. What was that oath exactly? Do no harm. All the medical people take it. Well, how are you doing no harm when you're holding back care? that they may need that'll actually make them better the longer you wait, the worse it gets or have a chance that something else might develop because of the lack of care, you know, whatever. But when insurance industries limit that care and stall or even deny care that we all know if held back will cause increased harm. We talked about that in the last show, swelling things. It's not long before we have to choose over and over again to do it anyway. That's the choice I was ended up making. Guys come to me crying because they're in their whatever veterans six months to wait before they can go see them they come in they're crying and their backs are hurting they need help my office is across the street from veterans i i'm like i got a veterans contract they call the uh for authorization for payment they say no he's got to go to veterans he's still yeah no we haven't released him well they're telling him six months. Mom, well, we'll care. He can wait. Got a pay pill. And these guys, you know, so we treat them anyway. Treat them for free. And even then, they would call us up later, say, if you don't, you know, you can't treat them for free. No. Then he, you know, they, they feel guilty. Feel like somebody's going to tattle on them. Whatever. So, you know, sometimes threaten even the guy. Threaten to take his benefits away if he didn't do what they wanted. It's a bunch of baloney. Uh, it's not long before we have to choose over and over again to do it anyway. We're constantly being brought to the table. We're the ones who are brought to the choice, like ivory. Do I choose to do what they want, or do I do what's right? Simple choices at first, right and wrong. Tax evasion or simple, you know, extra visits or whatever. And before you know it, that choice turns into more cheating, more theft, more sinister things, like forcing people to take something that's actually bad for them or pre-chemo before they have any cancer. Left alone, lift an air condition, left alone, treat anyway, wait for auth and not turn some suffering child away just because his back is so sore he can't even walk, let alone lift an air conditioner up a ladder onto a roof, earn a living, feed his kids. Choices. Do we treat any waste? Insurance doesn't care. They won't pay. If the patient can't, if we don't get authorization in advance, they won't pay. And he can barely pay for his food and his medical bills with what they give him for workers' comp, Medicare. You're a rich private practice owner. You can treat for free. Why not? It's only one and about a third of your patients are in the same boat. And before you know it, ultimately, if you don't do what they say, yeah, we'll just take your contract away completely. Obama's, the big Obama system sits in front of the demon, like drives the industry. It's just like this demon, Obama's face, Obamacare, it's just a demon. 
will take away all your faith, eventually take all your faith in the healthcare industry altogether. And either you can quit, sue us. We don't mind that. Yeah, sue us. We own the courts, they say. Either bend the knee or die. Because you you work for us, remember? You take a check from us. Wait a minute, no, I have my own business. Well, you still take a check from us. You get paid from the insurance. Well, educational system, you take a check from us. Government, take a check from us. Media, take a check from us. Entertainment, take a check from us. Doesn't matter. They own the systems. If the higher you go, the more in control, the more they bring you to choose. And the, every time you choose, if you choose them, you choose what's wrong, then the, God brings you to choose again. He doesn't, he tests you. He wants you to overcome. Long after you lose your practice, they steal your equipment. Can't, you can't have you open up again somewhere else. They belittle you in the process. You try to bring a better way to help people, a nobler one, a way that used to be done. Treating the cause and not just the injury. That's what we did. Treating people like people, even offering to help businesses, teach new therapists, nurses, doctors, options that not only will help many more patients much more effectively and faster, but will build their businesses, practice reputations, drawing not only more people to the door of care, but almost like-minded healthcare providers who entered the field in the first place. So they can even hire more staff that wants to do that sort of thing. It sounds great. Not merely for the money, but for the desire to actually help people. But here again, it's their game. It's their rules. Working for the companies, especially big ones, regardless of what sector of the industry, and it doesn't matter which sector you're in, the bigger the company, the worse they are pressured. They are pressured. Very quickly, they are pressed with decisions as you were. Do what they say, cut costs, cheat the patients, lie, steal, toss out who tell you or suffer the consequences, who they tell or suffer the consequences. Oh yeah, the guy who's trying to help put God into the health scenario. I don't care if he's helping people. He could have helped dozens of people finally find health when they only had doom before. Oh, he's grown your business, your staff, your offices, reduced building costs, programs, saved you hundreds of thousands of dollars, done everything you've asked him and then some, get rid of him or we cut you off. I've been hired by owners, by owners personally, sat down to dinner with them. Multi-state treatment organizations personally asked specifically, specifically, I won't even come on board unless you can allow me to incorporate God into the scenario. Oh, that's what I want. That's what I want. I want to change the face of my business so I can be more godly, treat the causes. I've always wanted that. Regain the lost reputation as my company that cares for people above the dollar. Grow, teach, recruit. Merely have the, merely to have the, the carpet yanked out from under me over and over again by one or another Rottweiler-faced, ass-licking little man complex, little man, control freak, guard dog, who thinks because he might have skinny arms and once sat on a bench of some sport somewhere, and he's, you know, he thinks that the, everybody works for him. Control freak. While the boss thinks this guy works for him, he doesn't. He works for the bosses above him. Actually, the boss, he's, he's there to guard him. Doing anything, making sure that anything unacceptable is not done. Rottweiler, I use Rottweiler for a reason. Rottweilers in Rome, I've done a lot of study about the Roman legions, et cetera, because the, the spiritual side of sicknesses are definitely demonic and they are orchestrated in a legion fashion, just like it, it says in the Bible. Jesus went and said to him, what is, a multitude, he said, what is your name? He said, I am legion. They give it away. The Roman legions were the most successful army uh, system to ever been developed in the world. And even today, many armies of the world, East and West, are mimicked after their divisionary concepts. One man in charge of 100, divided into smaller groups with one man guarding 20, in charge of 20, platoons, 
all come out of that Roman as situation. What were Rottweilers used for? There were Roman dogs. Interesting thing. And when the soldiers of Gaul, for example, would take over German, so take large portions of people, they would take all the women and children, enslave them, and then send the, send the men off to another part, maybe to Mesopotamia or to Egypt to fight in, their, in those legions. Those soldiers or those people, those slaves, were then thrust out into the front in what they called the Gregorian, the herd animals. They were given no weapons, no training, but they just put out there as a first attack group that would attack the ongoing, the now Mesopotamian attacking forces or whatever, you have the Egyptians, and they would be almost like thrown to the slaughter in order to, if they take, if one guy, if 10 guys takes out one of theirs, well, that's good, you know, they, they've lost. And anybody who survives many battles might be able to move back into the regular legion and ultimately get a sword and uniform and armor, whatever, armor, leather armor, as they move up the ranks. Interesting thing was the Roman dogs, the, the Rottweilers. They were not there to attack the opposing forces. They were there to stop the Gregorian from running. They had one choice to go into battle or be attacked by the dogs. That's what the dogs did. They were there to keep the so the 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 keep the herd animals pointed in the right direction, and that's what these Rottweilers do in these businesses. Key positions in businesses and major corporations to make sure that what the top dogs want gets done. Regardless, they may be the CEO, they could be a vice president, they could be a manager. That's not matter. Huh. And you know what's funny is all these Rottweilers, they kind of look alike too. They all have big, big fat faces and they're evil and bah, want to bite. See it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> kind of comical, actually. Today, we're just seeing an ever-increasing push to not only choose bad instead of good in the workplace. Everybody's out there. You, I'm sure that I'm not talking to one or two patriots, but... I bet you almost everybody today is being pushed into that scenario. Do they do bad or do, do they do good? Do, are the bosses telling them to do something they know is really not right? Three week old chicken on the back in the chicken rack on the, in the store. But since the evil has reared its ugly head now more than ever in every industry, mountain calling throughout the world, we're now placed more and more frequently as ivory was to choose now between evil and good. Nowhere more than my own industry, the medical industry. How many of my colleagues were forced to place diagnoses on people who had nothing else but the slightest symptom? COVID. Oh, I, who said that? I didn't say that. Comorbid. The accidental Freudian slip. Comorbid, 19. How many were told then to place people people on ventilators who had minimal symptoms. I know one friend of mine, his father, ship skipper his whole life, big bear of a man. He was, he was older, but 70s maybe. Went in for a allergy or cold and they shoved a ventilator down his throat and he was dead in a little bit of time. He did nothing, he had hardly any symptoms. It's ventilators in the medical scenario are only used when you have constriction of your airways and they have to open that up because you can't breathe because of the constriction. So they shove the ventilator in there to open it up so you can get some air in. Well, if you don't have anything wrong and you try to shove that in, it can be contraindicated. That's why you go to school for medicine, physical therapy, nursing, all the different things to learn not just the indications, but the contraindications. You can do more harm treating the wrong thing than often treating the right. A lot of people die from mis-hospitalization, mis-diagnosis every year. It's one of the leading causes of death, believe it or not. Huh, huh, the ventilators, okay. Maybe contraindicated. Okay, so, 
or may be even contraindicated for such aggressive procedures. How many hospital staff members dance around like fat as hippos in a, in a clown suit? We see that all at the beginning, parading like heroes to the public when they know the not so busy and not so overrun hospitals are just sleeper cells for ghouls waiting for an else, another victim to come in for a false test, test, false test, fake test. Then real people find out that the truth about hospitals were really ghost towns, services of skeleton by skeleton crews. As quickly as I did, that anyone or almost everyone I knew who worked there was sent home early on. All the people, all the doctors, nobody was working. So who was manning these overrun hospitals? This was quickly the question in any rational healthcare pr practitioner's mind. Who and what is behind all of this charade? I went, I went one time to, right at the beginning, I had to go see a patient. They were at the wing one of the hospitals or supposedly extended care, they call it, you know, where they get long-term care. He was still there. So I went there. Place was dead. And it was supposed to be full of patients. There was nobody in the parking lot. Walk in big cops. You can't come here. Nope. Nope. It's closed. Closed for COVID? Where is everybody? Go, go, go morbid. It doesn't take an Einstein to know that it's not a viable test anyway. If it was, why would they write it on the box, box that it's not valid for that 19 test? It's right on the box. And so-called now oath breakers who did that, who did say an oath for do no harm, have to move forward to this false positive, horrendously fatality, horrendous fatality that and desperate need to, of scam, as if it all true or risk losing their jobs too. You know how many people it takes to keep something like that going? Hospitals are empty, doctors are away, and yet they're reporting as if it's busy. Well, administrators, you know, staff, media, all these people, are they all complicit at the beginning? It's, but something was remember enough. Last year? Yeah, go ahead. Remember last year when mainstream media showed the lines of people standing in the summer in you, Phoenix yeah, my wife to, me. Get, <laughs> yeah. to get the test? It's supposed to be thousands of people standing. They Phoenix showed General. them on TV. Yeah. S excuse me? It was Phoenix General, the main hospital. Yeah, yeah. and they all had winter jackets on. I'm shocked in Phoenix with the temperatures. I moved here from Europe. There is no way somebody gonna put winter jacket in the middle of the summer in Phoenix and head on. And unbelievable it is that people, they don't question it. They see it on TV and they're all talking about, oh my God, so many cases. Look around, yeah. see the details. Yeah. And you know, this is what you talk about. When you start with a lie, when somebody is lying, it's very hard to keep it up without uh, going further and further in this. That's the problem about the lie. So everybody has to be in it. That's true. And they, they, and they begin to wonder why. What exactly are they trying to gain? What is the purpose here? You know, and if that's the lie, what else is the lie? I can, I can, I can actually even with confidence say that I treated a lot of patients when a lot of therapists wouldn't. I just called up some people and they, oh, do you know any therapists that will come and treat our people? They had the comorbid. Yeah, I'll go see them because I was already beginning to see that. I don't think this is what they're reporting because this just doesn't make sense. You know, I, I knew enough about virology. I know enough about immunology. I did that before I was a physical therapist to know that I can keep myself safe around people. I know what the the communicable risks are. I treated people with herpetitis and MRSA and all kinds of different things. Yeah. And it's like, well, I'm not afraid. I just make sure I'm safe and I'll, I know what the symptoms to look for. So if I see the symptoms, I'll stay, you know, cautious, you know. And uh, amazingly, everybody, nobody had symptoms. And then when I asked three quarters of the people about their issues, 
I've come to find out that they didn't even have symptoms to begin with. They went in with some completely other things. One guy was coming back from a chemo treatment and he was locked up in a nursing home. In his file, it clearly said he tested negative five times, but on his door, it said he was a patient. And I asked him, I said, what's going on? He goes, I don't know. He says, I'm stuck here. They won't let me leave. I got this plastic chair to sit on and this little cot. I don't even have a cell phone. I, I don't, I, it's been months. He says, I'm stuck here. I don't even know if I've got a house to go back to. My landlord doesn't like me. And I think if he, if I don't come back after a month or two, he's going to sell my stuff and take my Harley and I'm, I'm, I'm out. Poor guy. Lost everything. He has nobody to call. He can't escape. That's the, that's the kind of stuff that we're dealing with there. Those are people who are come to a crossroad and say, wait a minute, what am I doing here? Saying this guy has this illness when they don't? You, you make that choice. You got to keep going down that line. You got to keep going down that pay, you get a paycheck from the thieves. Suddenly one good person gets hurt, then it's 10, then it's 100. Then it's a thousand. Now you're a spokesperson standing up in front of the TV claiming, whoa, it's true. I saw it. When you saw nothing, you're just a liar. That's the problem when you say yes to the lie. God keeps bringing you back to make you say it again and again and again. Yeah. Does it begin? Liz, you want to say something? And uh, you are not less guilty than this guy on the top. No. You know, when you make this choice, there is no uh, little lie or bigger lie. Lie is a lie, especially, you know, when you hurt someone, there is a crossroad there and you cannot blame it. No, my boss told me so. Yeah. It was in Auschwitz as well. You know, that yet you cannot say that they told me to, to do it, that they told me to, to yeah. kill those people. Yeah. No. Yeah. The foot is just as guilty as the mouth of the body. Yeah. The eye is just as guilty as the hand. You don't kill, you don't execute just the, just the head and let the body walk free because they didn't do it. Cause Hey, he didn't say it. he's the one that did all the talking up there. Sorry. If you're part of the team, you're screwed. You know, when it, when the reckoning comes, this doesn't begin. Okay. Oh, I lost my place here. Okay, let's see. This doesn't begin to demonstrate the amount of elderly given vaccine vac vac without even their consent, merely to have the option to go to the hospital or visit a loved one, loved one there. You know, I have I work mostly with elderly. I can't tell you how many nursing homes the people were just marched out and lined up and boom, 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 boom. No consent. No HIPAA. They get, they, it, they didn't care. You know, do you have your, come up, get another one. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. And you know who the groups were the worst? The biggest ones, the biggest nursing homes, the biggest public buildings, the government houses, the big business, Walmarts, Costco's, Home Depot's. <coughs> they were like first in line. Had, they had plenty of uh, things covering, their, you know, plenty available for all their, you know, people, essential businesses. They have to all have their, you know, say, if you don't have it, you got to wear them. You know, even though the mandate is long gone, they still have to wear. We have a store right by our house. Nobody in the store wears them anymore. The mandate's been lifted, except all the people that, that work there that haven't got this. They have to wear that. Well, if nobody's wearing it, and everybody supposedly has got this, then why do you have to wear it? Who are you going to catch it from? The guys who already got this? Always a Rottweiler in the mix. Always. Funny thing about these, I started my practice about 35 years ago, maybe 32 years ago, 33. And at first I was in business, had a little office, in different doctor's offices, just one or two rooms, and I would treat the patients that they have to send me or others. That's how my business started. And this one doctor became good friends with me, and we, we, we actually talked a lot. We sat around talking, and he'd show me some different things, and I showed him some things from therapy, and we kind of had that rapport. And one day, 
he got this big thing that came in the mail, like a tray, almost like a big metal tray full of these little, you know, these for the flu, the yearly flu. He was looking at it and he goes, oh, I hate these things. I said, why? And he goes, ah, I don't know. He says, I never could tell if people got, you know, the people that got it, half of them ended up getting the flu anyways. And people that didn't, didn't seem to make any difference. He goes, and I just never really, I, I just never liked him. He says, he's a good guy. He's an old country doctor. Best doctor I ever met. Matter of fact, I wrote about him in my book. But the thing about him is they finally didn't like the way he did his country doctoring. They ran him out of the business. And they ruined him. Like a lot of other the really good ones. The ones that they couldn't buy, they ruined. But one day, like I said, he had this tray full of the little vials. And I'm sitting there and he's unpacking all the other stuff that came in these boxes and medicines to test samples that he could put in this thing and his cabinet that he'd give to people. And uh, I said, well, oh, that's strange. Why are some of those purple, there's four or five, six purple ones and there's the rest of them are pink. Hmm. I don't know, I've never seen that before. He rips open the plastic and pulls it out and looks at it and looks at the other ones. And the other ones clearly have the label, the normal label. And this, and then this one had a different label. It's kind of weird. It didn't, it didn't have, it didn't really look like the others at all. I don't know. I'm gonna find out. So into his little office, he walks and he gets on the phone. He calls the company that sends them the stuff and tells them, hey, I got this set, and there's a set of there's six or seven of these. Oh, those are for me? I didn't order them special. Oh, okay. Well, why is that? Hmm. Okay. He hangs up the phone, comes back. He says, that is weird. They said, those are the VIP. There's, there's for you and your family. He said, well, are they different? Well, I'm not at liberty to say. Well, I didn't even order them. Hmm. And the guy hangs up. It wasn't 10 minutes later, someone comes, walks in the office and we come to pick up those purple vials. They weren't for you. They were sent by mistake. And out they came and they disappeared. That was the last time that doctor that I knew for many years used them. He would take them and he'd toss them in the trash. He had to pay for them. They're 10, $12 a piece. Yes, yeah, cost him thousands of dollars that they automatically would send them for all of his people. He'd ask his people who want it, but he wouldn't push it if they didn't want it. He didn't push them. He only would give it if they if they wanted it. You know, if they didn't want it, he wouldn't make them or or prescribe it or push it on them in any way. And often he would just toss them. He just stopped using them. He said to me, he "Goes, I'm not. I can't stand behind a product that I don't even know what they if it's good or bad for people." And he says, "I have a hard enough time with a lot of the things they push on me." He said, "But this, once I found out that they have special for special people, he said, nah." That was it. He was done. And so was his practice shortly after that, or not, not long after that, maybe three years, four years. So often and more increasingly, we seem to be brought to the point of needing to choose when we finally say no, when they order us to go along with their lie, business is business, let alone buyer beware, all that shit. Do we wait until they make us ourselves buy in, become partners? Take the, you know what, ourselves, if we want to work in their hospitals or play on their team, their sports team. Okay, we take the risk. Now what? Then they ask us to give it to others. Now you have to participate. Now you have to be in it. You have to do it to other people. Be a spokesman. Put others in danger. And when that does, when that's not enough, okay, now let's start giving them to children who've been long told that they have little chance of contracting these wannabe plagues. Zero chance of dying. Lie to the masses, even though we know the product could even you know, hurt them. They're certainly toxic. Some things are toxic in there, mercury, different things, formaldehyde. 
doesn't take an Einstein to know that those things are bad for you. But at last, they dumb down the people, at the very least. They put in controls or triggers that in, when combined with other factors, other parts, segments, pieces that they delivered from other systems, from other entry points, up your butt maybe, <laughs> and facilitate even a worse problem than the ones you've been lied to about it so far. Their numbers are exaggerated. The death numbers, we had less deaths in 2020 than we had in 2019. No deaths from heart attack or heart problems or even influenza first year ever that there was no influenza deaths. <laughs> no, they're all comorbid deaths. The numbers were almost identical. Well, that's strange. So much so that now we all have to get this because they're so worried about our health doesn't make sense any more than it makes sense that when everyone else is shut down, the billionaires of the world's world became trillionaires. That doesn't make sense either, but it, it's true. So what do we do when or where do we cross the line? When is it that we have to actually do it to our own children? Now we have to take it home and give it to our children. And if we don't, they'll take the kids away from us. Well, when we, is that when we say no? Well, what about if they say, okay, now we want you to give them pre-cancer chemo. I had a lady one time who sat and cried to me because her doctor had told her she needed pre-cancer chemo. Her husband was this old guy, could barely walk. She ran around the house as fit as, as could be. Tennis shoes. I said, well, you don't, you don't have any. Why would they give you chemo for... No, I don't have... I, well, they must have called it something else. Hodgkin's or something like that. Sometimes they give those different names. No, I was tested for all of that. I got zero, nothing. Doctor said, well, then we're going to do pre-cancer chemo. You know, and what do you do when they look you in the eye and they say, what would you do? Well, oh, ma'am, I can't really talk about that. That's not my job. I'm a therapist. I'm not here. Well, what if it was your mom? What would you do? Crossroad. You tell them the lie or you tell them the truth. You recommend that, hey, I'd go get another opinion. And if that one doesn't work, get another one, another one, another one. Keep getting another opinion until somebody tells you the truth. I said, but whatever you do, don't tell the boss. I said that because if he finds out, yeah, sure enough, the next day, another notch on my bed, another lost job. Guy comes to me and says, hey, I like you. You know you good therapist you do a good job but when the c doctor calls and says he has to go it's his business he pays he sends us a lot of patients so what can i do yeah what can you do crossroad yeah but where is the line the line of no return is it when you give up your wife your best friend maybe your own life Maybe that's the ultimate thing. You have to, when you are finally being brought to that guillotine, you have to choose a zombie life, voiceless zombie servitude. You know, we used to joke about the Chinese. They walk around with those things on, like zombies, and everybody in the in the West used to laugh at them. Now, now who's laughing? The joke's on us. Yeah, we have two choices: stay. Or do as they tell us. Do as they tell us or quit our job. Maybe there's a third choice. Maybe there's a third choice. I'm going to read you from an article that I actually have in my, it's in my Heal Yourself for God's Sake book. I'm going to read a little bit of it, not the whole thing. Bullies demonstrate themselves in many forms. Not always limited to the pimple face, somewhat overweight boy, large in statue, for no other reason than the fact that at least one time being held back in the early stages of educational experience. Gave him the illusion that he was actually bigger than others, lacking as much in the cute existential comment department as they do in, in compassion. But always presenting their own hearts that drive them to a particular behaviors of cruelty perpetuated against weaker defenseless opponents. Bullies present oftentimes for reasons known only to their own 
jealous desires. Once said bully is spotted, or at least finds himself within striking range, one of three response, responses of the would-be victim usually is eliminated, is, yeah, especially if the bully has already placed claws or filthy teeth on said, said soft flesh, or in some stronger and rare cases, the fight. But those two choices are turn and run, or the option of just take it, take it, take it, take it. And that's what, unfortunately, the Medicare, the, medis, the medical group will tell you to do. Take it. There's nothing you can do. Take the medicine. Just take it. Oh, you have pain? Ah, take the pain pill. Just live with it. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing I can do. Oh, by the way, pay me. Oh, I can't fix your car. There's nothing I can do. Pay me and come back in two weeks. I'll tell you again that I can't help you. They pay me again. <laughs> My colleagues, hilarious. But first, we must further examine the run and hide option. In part, turning represents a physical changing direction from the path in which one has set. When one turns their back on something, it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to see it. Thus, the person becomes blind to everything that lies down that particular path. They were only moments before. Not to mention turning from the path on which they set their mind to. It is now an, a notion of defeat. Turning one's back on the attacker puts the victim in a particularly vulnerable position. If presenting one's back, inviting attack without defense, blind to any blows, tail tucked in a pathetic attempt to protect private parts in a backside running retreat. Yes, running like a chicken with his tail tucked. In the case of disease or other spontaneously occurring afflictions or pretty much any attack out there that's out there, Many of these seem to arise without specific physical events tied to the cause. But remember, we are taught that diseases, which by the way, can never be seen because they are too small to see, too faint to smell, or too light or few to feel. We just know or believe them to be real because we have been told they are. But we also program to feel we are absolutely helpless in these attacks and eventually destruction they may elicit, or at least we are told from our earliest memories. Very quick, I want to add a little part here that I didn't before. When I was, like I said, I worked in immunology before I was physical therapist. I had the honor of working for this one particular doctor. I won't mention his name, but he worked with amoebas. These little teeny, they're actually bigger than most bacteria, but they're still pretty small. And I was asking him about it. And he said, well, would one particular amoeba that I work with and for some reason, it decides, it freaks out. You can eat it. It can be on anything, an orange, a piece of lettuce, very hard to clean off. So we eat them all the time and they're all around us. They're on our skin, they're everywhere. They're all over the world, pretty much everywhere. People eat them and they digest them and they just live and die and the acid eats them up. But for some reason, one out of maybe a hundred million freaks out and bores a hole in your stomach all the way to your brain and it starts multiplying up here and you're dead, no cure. And there's no rhyme or reason to why this person or that person, because one will happen in China and the other one will happen in Australia and then somebody down in Mexico and then before you know somebody in Canada, it has nothing to do with the weather or the climate or the food or the race, even the sex. And they don't know why. They just know that for some reason, this amoeba changes its mind and decides to attack. Isn't it's my job to figure out what it is. So I get samples of the dead person and look at those amoebas and try to figure out what makes them different than the others. And so far we can't find any difference. Hmm. You know what's interesting is I teach that sicknesses are it's very small little physical things, experiential, meaning how many times you might have your attacks and how many times you, how long, how, what parts of the body they attack. And spiritual, they're driven by a spirit. In this case, a malevolent spirit that wants to kill us. Kind of sounds like this amoeba. Very small, can't see it. 
one little guy by himself, not a whole group. And then it suddenly decides to attack. Well, how does it decide? Did it just suddenly say, ooh, that looks like a pretty good brain up there. I think I'll go that way. It, it, does, it, it, it doesn't make any sense, except from a standpoint of a malevolent spirit. And so when you know, as of these sicknesses, and you know that, ooh, I felt this before. This is the attack. I'm on to you. And you ask God to shine a light on what on that malevolent spirit, it will leave, leaving that little husk of a amoeba behind, and it has it won't do anything because it, it can't think for itself. It can barely move. I leave off. Did you want to throw anything in here before I move on, honey? No, just move on. Okay. We don't see them, feel them, and know for sure that they're even present, but we are told, taught, and convinced that they are real. The symptoms of our body are, are the proof in most cases the symptom of our body fighting them has been misconceived to be the actual sickness itself. So, for example, you have a fever. The fever is not the sickness, but the, the result of the person's body trying to rid itself of the would-be attacker. Amazing how fear can make the most insignificant speck of essence into a giant. But we, but let us make one thing clear. We are talking about a bully here, not standing and fighting battles we are not prepared or equipped to do, nor called to fight against in our own proper time. By him who would command us is foolish. Running and while it's certain undeniable and overpowering attacks, survival can in itself find certain qualities of victory. But for the sake of bullying, or in the case of the very start of an affliction, we can assume that God will never put, place his children who seek him in a place where defeat is possible unless he's calling us home, of course. God keeps all of his promises. It is up to us to remember this promise, avoiding the storm altogether, which includes changing the directions you are walking through the, through the journey, which is in your life. It's not a bad idea, especially when the direction is wrong or destructive for you or others in that, for that matter. But changing the direction, quitting a job that is bad for people, is not always feasible, considering some storms come upon us so fast and unexpected. It's almost impossible to avoid them. I've noticed people who often avoid contact with infections at all costs or take extreme, almost fanatic action to isolate themselves from injuries, often end up following in fear more than not and catch the very thing they're fear, they're, they fear anyways. When a person does happen to see danger and chooses a different path, leaves the previous experience or issues unresolved that will result in the constant searching in the dark bushes, looking over the shoulder, waiting for the attack posture, once again, facilitated by fear. And, and a distraction from the path immediately results, taking your eye off where you were going and where exactly you're stepping, the fall is imminent. Fear the bully or the storm may show up along a path, a new path taken results, and in this, and this can be overpowering and the fear actually begins to smell. It really smells. People start to smell like that. Fear is taken on by a childlike, almost like a child draping a red cloak over his body and quivering in the middle of the field. And the angry bull is immediately attracted, resulting in the very thing the, fear child, the child fears. Remember, we're dealing with here creatures like little animals, like animals. They're, they're animals, these demons, and they smell fear. These spirits live to be known only, they only know fear. They recognize it and feed on fear. Fear is all they have. They have it and they desire it for themselves. They're drawn to it like flies to a dying carcass. Sickness like flies from what or where they come, so they are also so are they also drawn. Both results, running or just taking it, are in no way desirable and often result in a child having to usually suffer the brunt of the storm anyway. No matter how the child tries to avoid or run, it always seems to run into the bully anyways. They find him or the confrontation is inevitable. So turning and running for the most part demonstrates and grants, if not directly, inevitably an assured defeat. Nobody ever wants to feel like a coward, yet the feeling is put on our, by ourselves. When we run from the path we thought we should be on, all because of fear. So that leaves only one choice. Yes, the bullies and the disease. The best one is to stand our ground and fight. For, for God has said in many places of the Bible, I will give you all you need. 
He also said, but, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory through Jesus Christ, through Christ. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be given unto you. Notice he says, seek ye first. So by assumption, we must be seeking first, doing what we are supposed to do in each and every one of our steps. Then we can also assume by his promise that he will give us all we need to overcome the challenge and the attacks that present itself on this path. But God also doesn't honor the footsteps of fools. If we, by our, by our own selfish desires, pride, lust, or arrogance, or whatever, find ourselves not, off the, not only off the fat path, but knee-deep in the camp of the enemy, then getting away with our need to overcome may just reside in a pair of good legs and an oxygen enough in our blood to get us out of there barely with our skin. So back to the bully. If running is defeat, sorry about my dog. It results in two things that are not, not only good, but could even remotely turn to positive. It reduces the value of the statue of our would-be hero in the eyes of most watching those eyes of himself being the greatest affected. Popular phrases include, once a coward, always a coward, you chicken. These are such endearing terms and associated with people who flee. God's ability to even turn this into the positive is without dispute, but we'll save that for later. The second effect of running is that it builds a confidence in said bully, making it more likely that he will just do his mouthing off again louder next time more often and cause more damage in the, in the, in the distinct future. So confident is the bully of where he's been that he doesn't even have to look back himself, so why should he? He's conquered everything behind him. But it is his confidence that exposes his weakness. It is the track in which they come that shows you which direction to fight. Third choice, stand and fight. Do not fear, I am with you. I remember, I remember as a young youth, avoiding bullies for many months and possibly as much as a year finally, until finally I resolved myself that I would not run again. Taking my normal route home from school, I turned around some bushes on the path and just to find myself again face to face with said bully. A larger boy with reputation for cruelty, he immediately started to advance, but slowed when I held firm and said, hell, I guess if I didn't say hell, I said, well, <laughs> I wouldn't say hell back then. <laughs> Maybe I did. I don't know. Well, I guess if you need, you need to do this, let's do it. Putting up my hands to defend myself as half his size skinny. Maybe a slight prayer of my own, praying to God like, now would be a good chance to help me, God, if you could. Now I know the larger boy saw the fear in my eyes and his advance was certain, but the confidence quickly subsided as he looked past me at the figure that just happened to step around the bushes after me, Ronnie Mayberry, and an even larger, more athletic boy from the same class, suddenly steps around the bush, up the path, and immediately moves towards the would-be bully, taking him firmly by the collar and stating in no uncertain terms that his bullying days were over. While there wasn't much size difference between them, it was clear who has the confidence and who was afraid. The would-be bully whimpered and made his promise that, and, and to my knowledge, never bullied anyone again. Bullies are like diseases, are really cowards in disguise. Turn on the light and they always run. Ronnie, the, Ronnie was an angel sent by God. He, he might not have even known it at the time, but the bully was, you know, he knew it. And, in both cases where they were used for my education. The essence of reality, funny how it is that people are so easily convinced of what is reality and what is not. Interesting story about bullying, I'll tell this real quick, is that we wind this thing down here, is my wife, Anna, tells me when we first were married, she said, oh, I had a case where I ran into a bully. She said, when I was about eighth grade, starting to develop as a woman, she was already a dancer, so she was very fit. And um, one day she was standing in line for something, maybe books or maybe lunch. And she felt somebody grab her butt. So she turned around and butts, slapped them so hard and knocked this boy down onto the ground. Only problem was it was the school bully. This boy, man, flunked four or five times. And he was probably twice the size as anybody else. And the minute she hit him, she's like, holy mackerel, what did I do? And down he went. <laughs> Of course, once he came to his senses, she was the only one that ever hit him. He fell in love with her and <laughs> stopped being a bully. I'm tell this story, but I kind of told But in the, in the process, uh, a lot of people witness this. 
and they got encouraged. They didn't know that I didn't know that this was the bully. So they just saw me standing up for myself. I think it was God that prompted me to turn around and do it. So a lot of people change. And in the end, also this bully changed because uh, being defeated for the first time, he started to help actually the uh, younger kids in school and he became like a savior to go to. So yeah, yeah. standing up to the bully can change a lot. Yeah, which we chase, you chase this, you knock the shit out of that bully. <laughs> and you know what, in essence, when we turn and look with God and the light onto these demonic attacks, and the spirit of the of the spirit of malevolence leaves. All you're left with is that physical thing that really won't harm you, even if it did, even if even if it wanted to, but it doesn't. So yeah. it just you know it could be harmless. We have viruses, bacteria, amoebas all over our body that harm us. That's how I knew I wasn't going to be harmed by comorbid when I went and treated those first people. So I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I have nothing to worry about. It's not going to attack me because I'm not afraid. I know that God protects me because I'm not afraid. You know, interesting, another one interesting thing is I love St. Francis. St. Francis is well known for A, stepping away from the then ruling Catholic Church and saying, I'm not going to be a part of it because A, you're not teaching the people in their home language you're teaching in Latin, nobody understands it except the rich. So people go to church and only the rich understood what was going on and the poor stood in the back. And they don't know, they, they just sit there and pray, but they don't even know what they're praying for. They, they weren't taught. So St. Francis looked and he said, I'm not gonna be a part of this. I, you know, those people deserve God too. And he embraced a leper. He, on his day, he left, he embraced this leper in a very, you know, documented and um, pretty, you know, dramatic style. And there, from that moment on, it is, it is clinical, it is, it is historical fact that in a time of leprosy around 1000, 1100 AD, when there was no cure for leprosy, to touch it was a doom. You were going to get it and you were going to be doomed. You were going to get it. They would burn entire villages where a leper would come. Yet, him and his followers treated thousands, and not a single one of them caught leprosy. Documented fact. Did he have some secret medicine that he knew wasn't going to do it to him? Choices. He knew that if God wanted him to have leprosy, he was going to get it. And if he didn't want it, it, it wasn't up to the leprosy. It was up to, not that God wants us to get sick. No, God wants us to overcome. God wants us to not take this when they tell us to. God wants us to, when we find out that our boss is doing something wrong, telling us to do something wrong, stand up. We don't know we're going to get fired. You don't know that until you do. As a matter of fact, you, you don't know anything except for the, the fact that you stand up. Now, you might get fired. I got fired many times. And maybe not. But maybe you know, something could, better is coming. Maybe something better is coming. Yeah, maybe something And better. God gives us a choice to live in the truth or in the lie. When we live in the truth, we're getting stronger. We're strengthening our immune system. Mm -hmm. Even... Uh, kinesiology proves it that we have more strength if we tell the truth even when we're testing our arm and we're pushing on it when we're lying the arm goes down when we're saying the truth the arm is strong and we can't control it so this is on the physical level it's uh, it's proven true true so it is yeah. and we have in this time in this day and age more and more us as truthers us as patriots, us as light walkers, walking in the, in the clouds with, with Jesus. Because truths cause our vibration to lift and our ascension to be, to be assured. 
standing and fighting for what is right is not the same as quitting. Getting fired for what is right is no different than taking fire. Taking fire in a hot spot in some you know, back road in Afghanistan for what is right and true to save others. It's all war. War's war. We're in an end times war right now. The Congressional Model of Honor was awarded, is awarded. It's the highest award in our country. And it's not awarded for battles won or for years of service or even for rank achieved in armed, in armed conflicts. If that was the case, every Colonel Clink that's out there would or above would get one. No, they're given for people who risk their own life to save others. And only for that. The, the majority of the time, the people that actually qualify, the men and the women, women, woman, only one in history has gotten it. They die in the process, the majority, mostly the men. The woman didn't die, but she was a prisoner of war. We're at war today. How many lives are saved when truthers, you, spread these truths to people who are in prison and might be able to use a truth as a key to unlock this prison of cards and these bars of lies and free themselves to go out there and spread the word to others. That's what the war we are. It's a war of souls, not of bullets or riots, although there's riots all over the world. But you really want to make a difference. And you can go out and do videos. You can go out and spread truths. You can, you can help. You can help, you can share videos like this or like David's, Charlie's, Mel K's, 107. Share it with your friends. Dig this stuff out yourself, research it, verify it works, and then show that to your friends, the, the, the research that you've yourself validated. You know, if, you're, if you, you believe this or believe that, you know, don't just take it on the word of people, check it out but then spread the word, help your neighbor. Don't just walk by and let him sit in a ditch or worse yet, cross the road and act like he doesn't exist. We're all in a war today. How many lives are saved by truthers who risk their jobs, families, their very lives to bring the much needed information to the masses, knowing they will no doubt be hunted down, silenced or worse yet killed for their commitment to saving lives instead of allowing and even placing them at risk by doing what the job tells you to do. I'm not telling you to quit your job. I'm telling you to fight. Fight for your rights. Well, if you like this video, please share it or subscribe. It'll be attached to our blog, which I have written out a little bit more in depth, some of these stories so that you can read about them. You can also read many of these stories in our Heal Yourself for God's Sake book or our quantum ascension book and you can get both on amazon for now until i find a new publisher i have other books i want to publish so if you know anybody that's a publisher or would like to help me publish that would be great or your publisher yourself join a team we need team members that'll help spread the truth that are doing it for god and want to join god's army yeah right now i just self-publish we also can find us at paulorpeter.com, the blog site. And it is, again, as Spiritual Therapies with Peter and Anacola. You can also find, you can email me questions. I do a questions and answers with Spiritual Truths and Spiritual Therapies. Already done one video. It's back there in the list. Posture.is.everything at gmail.com. Or you can join the, the uh, Ninos Insiders and get to talk to my wife. Maybe. You can ask for her, I guess. I don't know. I don't know if that's allowed. But then you can be uh, an insider. And yeah, she's, you just get her to speak a different language to you. That'd be fun. <laughs> Especially if you're from another country. Anyway, um, I hope, Anna, you have anything you want to say? Yeah, I totally agree that we're all just sitting and waiting until somebody else is going to do it for us. No, we all need to take the step, the step now, bring our own little light to the picture. We're all part of this puzzle. Nobody is less important than anybody else. So let's just do something. Yes. 
Agreed. And I will finish as I often do with a little prayer. And let's see if I can miss just enough. Yes. Dear Lord, please open my eyes, those of my friends and my loved ones, to the lies of the enemy. Give us strength, wisdom, and discernment as your path for our lives and the battles you may wish us to fight. Anyways, have a great day and bless you all until we see you again. Bye-bye.